I've talked with a few, few of you over email. Um, and we're just gonna kind of go over an overview. So our agenda for today is We're just gonna do a few introductions to introduce you to our team, um, do a bit of an overview of the opportunity and talk a bit about how to apply. And then there will be some time for questions and answers at the end. Um, I'm just gonna address probably the most popular question, which is yes, um, we will record today's session as well as send out the link for the recording to everyone who registered um, in case you need to reference that as you work on your application. Um, the PowerPoint will be available in the chat and we'll also send that out as well via email. So just as an overview, just to introduce um, our project team. So from the Michigan Public Health Institute, we're part of two centers that are on this project, the Center for Healthy Communities, as well as the Center for Health Equity Practice. Um, and then we have our state partners um, from the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services within the Office of Equity and Minority Health. Um, and then the funding is through um, the CDC. So I'm gonna pass it off to uh, Brenda to talk a bit of the overview here. Thank you, Danielle, yeah. and good morning, everyone. Very happy to be um, in this webinar with you this morning. And I, again, as Danielle said, I'm Brenda Jagaday, and I lead our Office of Equity and Minority Health within the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. And we are a part of the department's Race, Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion Office. And I also am the project director for the CDC grant. So just good morning again. Uh, these next couple of slides emphasize why our Office of Equity and Minority Health, why we decided to re respond to CDC's request for a proposal. At the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic, we witnessed and we experienced how lethal, and I use the word lethal, I've heard our Lieutenant Governor Grill Gilchrist used that word, but how lethal COVID-19 was in racial and ethnic communities, especially among African Americans when we look at COVID cases, COVID hospitalizations, and COVID deaths. Additionally, other racial and ethnic groups experience poor access to culturally and linguistically appropriate care and messaging, and there were record numbers of racial harassment and violent acts against the Asian and Pacific Islander community. We also heard from many in the Hispanic and Latino community and refugee community that they experienced lack of access to services due to language barriers and due to some of them having an undocumented status in Michigan. We also heard about gaps in services for people with disabilities, people who are without insurance, people experiencing mental health conditions, people experiencing homelessness, and people with substance use. The list could go on and on. The point is that the challenges that our residents faced in receiving the information and care needed were unacceptable. For some, COVID-19 clearly demonstrated on our next slide, racism, classism, and other forms of oppression and discrimination. And many times it's easy for us to see how, uh, for instance, transportation, not having transportation can inhibit someone's ability to get to the doctor or to the grocery store or to work or how working in positions that do not provide health insurance or provide them with paid time leave, how that can put people at an increased risk for contracting COVID or at an increased risk for exposing themselves or others, their loved ones, their community to COVID. We are more easily able to see these social determinants of health as we call them sometimes, but not able to see the policies and laws that have been formed and influenced by racism, by classism, by forms of oppression. Those things that result in poor or limited choices that residents live with daily 
and how those poor or limited choices result in worse health outcomes, worse health outcomes for those that have been marginalized in our society. So we're thankful that many entities and organizations are working together to address the needs of our residents, to improve their quality of life and their life expectancy. This is the intention of this funding opportunity, to build, to leverage, to expand infrastructure support for COVID-19 prevention and control among populations that are at higher risk and underserved. Uh, these graphs on the next slide, they represent COVID cases and deaths per million by race. Blacks or African-Americans have the highest cases, followed by whites, American Indians and Alaska Natives and Asian and Pacific Islanders. Black or African-Americans and American Indians and Alaskan Natives have suffered more deaths from COVID-19. And not shown in these graphs, the case rates for Hispanic and Latinos, they are higher than those that are non-Hispanic or Latino. And currently, our Native Americans have the highest death rate in our state. So our mission in the Office of Equity and Minority Health is to provide a persistent and continuing focus on ensuring health equity and eliminating disparities among our five racial and ethnic populations in Michigan, or I should say these five racial and ethnic populations in Michigan. African-Americans, our American Indians and Alaska Natives, Arab and Chaldean Americans, Asian and Pacific Islanders, and Hispanic and Latinos. And on the next slide, you'll see these 14 regional areas were selected because these are the areas where the majority of racial and ethnic residents reside. Over 80% of Michigan's African Americans, Asian and Pacific Islanders, and Arab and Chaldean Americans reside in these regions. More than 65% of Hispanic and Latinos reside in these regions. And whereas about 80% of African Americans and Asian Americans and Arab and Chaldean Americans reside in only about six counties or less in our state, Native Americans are more dispersed across the state. It would take up to 32 counties for us to show where 80% of Native American resides. But here in these areas that were selected, nearly 50% of Native American resides, reside in these regions. So finally, we are really excited about the opportunity to partner with organizations like yours, organizations that have demonstrated their ability to provide services to our racial and ethnic residents. I thank you and I turn it back over to Danielle. You're on mute, Danielle. I'm gonna start us off with a bit of an overview of the project, talking a bit about the goals, objectives and activities. So next slide. Um, so the overall project goals are focused on reducing and eliminating COVID related inequities impacted um, and at risk minority populations that we just went over. And then to award community organizations to serve as backbone organizations and act as fiduciaries and conveners for the 14 regions that we've just listed. The hope is that they'll be able to implement equity throughout all of the project activities. Next slide. So this is the overall timeline. Um, we will be accepting letters of intent starting today. Um, and then we will also be taking and answering any questions that folks have up until 5 p.m. on the 29th. Um, applications will be due on April 14th at 5 p.m. via email. And then we will be notifying the awardees on May 6th um, with the project start date of June 1st. And this project will run from June 1st, 2020 through to May 31st, 2023. Next slide to talk a bit about the funding. Um, each awardee will receive a base level funding of 
thousand. Um, the intent is to support um, at minimum the following activities, the hiring of a coordinator um, to manage the activities, as well as um, support any sort of data, media, outreach kind of material needs that you all might have, um, and provide financial support um, to the council members that um, serve on the council as well as community members and then funding resources to support the convenings. So the intent here is that the backbone agency is going to primarily act as a fiduciary and coordinator for our councils, um, subcontracting out funds to council members and for the activities that they'll support around COVID disparities and COVID mitigation. Um, and so the funding uh, ceiling for this project is 675000 Next slide. So eligible applicant organizations. They must be established respected community organization um, that has demonstrated a commitment to improving equity and health outcomes within one of the 14 regions of focus. Um, we will ask for you to be able to provide documentation of those uh, connections that you have through the completion of at least three health equity council commitment forms from some of those closely tied agencies that you work with, which might include grass, grassroots organizations that are willing to participate on the council if you were awarded. So, um, and you must be able to highlight evidence commitment to disparities um, through past or future planned activities and demonstrate some of your experience conducting outreach um, to one of the one or more of the five racial ethnic minority populations and have some of the internal capacity to act as a fiduciary and convener um, and perform the required functions of the BBO. And we'll go over the required functions of the BBO or backbone organization on this slide. So um, the intent is that they will act as the guiding vision and supporting strategy through development through an equity lens. Um, so the BBO works with the regional council to prioritize equity in the development of the guiding vision through the acquisition of data, um, the prioritization of um, opportunities for action and adaptation of contexts and systems. So the second piece of that is supporting aligned activities. So the backbone organization or BBO is expected to facilitate any dialogue between council members, um, partners that you all are able to bring to the table and facilitate those discussions in an effort to support activities. Third piece here is establishing shared measured practices. So there will be some evaluation and some metrics measuring pieces here to see the progress of the health equity councils. And so as the backbone agency, you'll kind of support the development and monitoring of those shared evaluation practices. Fourth, cultivating a community engagement and ownership. So, um, you know, cultivating some broad relationships across sectors and throughout the community, um, both with traditional and non-traditional partners um, in, in an effort to build an inclusive and authentically engage and foster ownership within the, sorry, within the community over the long term. So the hope is that over, not only will these relationships that you build last throughout the project period, but hopefully support activities long-term. And fifth is um, focused on advancing policy and equitable systems change. So that the BBO will be able to support equity-centered policy with an agenda that impacts large systems and institutions in an effort to bring overall health outcomes and dismantle some of the structural barriers that folks are facing as they re um, try to optimize their health. And lastly, mobilizing resources. So the Backbone Agency will play a key role in developing resources for the initiative, um, supporting sustainability of efforts, as well as fundraising, recruiting volunteers, identifying leverage points within the community, um, and providing non-monetary support as well as monetary support. 
Um, as you might have noticed, equity is at the foundation of all of the work that we are looking for in our backbone organization applicants. Um, and so this model that we are talking about here is pulled from um, collective impact. Um, next slide. So I am going to pass it off to Jaquetta to talk a bit about the funding objectives and um, project requirements. Thank you, Danielle. I'm Jaquetta Hinton and I'm with the Office of Equity and Minority Health. And I'll go over a couple of slides on the funding objectives and the project requirements. So for our funding objectives, this funding has two funding objectives. And under objective number one, which is to reduce and eliminate COVID-19 inequities in impacted and at-risk populations in each region. This is to be accomplished by forming a regional health equity council made up of community organizations that's actively engaged within the five minority populations most impacted by COVID-19. Also to establish community-driven decision-making and priority settings to develop an action plan to address and reduce community priority risk factors and needs related to COVID-19 and other root causes of health inequity, to develop and implement practices and policies to promote equity and reduce regional health disparities, and to establish distribution and efficient use of resources to support effective communities, including organizations and community leaders both existing and emerging. Next slide. Funding objective number two requires the development of a sustainability plan to maintain the Health Equity Council's work, including the council's ability to serve as part of a statewide advisory council in the event of another public health emergency. Next slide. The project requirements and project management requires hiring a project coordinator to support and monitor project activities, to monitor and track council activities, to support the allocation of resources to member organizations and council activities, to track and coordinate council memberships and involvement, and to maintain consistent engagement and convening of community partners to determine activities and implement action plans, to coordinate council activities with leadership and staff support, to develop appropriate business processes and pursue necessary trainings to carry out project activities, to actively track project budget expenditures and progress towards required deliverables, and to ensure that all required CDC reporting data is provided on a quarterly basis. Required data will include the number and types of new and existing and expanded partnerships engaged each quarter. And to ensure completion and submission of data collection along program evaluation indicators. Next slide. The project requirements also want to establish memberships for health equity councils and identify community needs of the region. Each council must include a minimum of three community members, meaning that individuals must live within the region and are not employed by the backbone organization or a partner organization, and community members must be financially compensated for their time. Also to convene health equity councils with community organizations that serve minority populations most impacted by COVID-19, create inclusive and engaging council sessions that minimize power differentials and encourage participation from all members, and to facilitate council meetings to assess community strengths, barriers, and needs, and help lead review of policies and practices that create barriers and inequities in access to services. Next slide. In continuing our project requirements, 
is to assist health equity councils in establishing community goals, objectives, and action plans that prioritize equity to track project activities and process towards goals, report monthly to MPHI and MDHHS and OEMH. Act as a fiduciary for the Health Equity Council through grant budget tracking and funding project activities and to ensure equitable and efficient distribution of resources. To participate in all required calls, assessments, trainings, and technical assistance and quarterly learning meetings. To serve as a mentor organization for grassroots organizations that are members of the Health Equity Regional Council and to assist with capacity building to foster their leadership and growth. And to guide health equity councils through final reporting processes, evaluations, and planning for sustainability. Thank you. I'll turn it back over to Dania. Or Afton, turn it back over to Afton. Thank you. Thank you, Jaquetta. Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Afton Shavers. I'm in the Office of Equity and Minority Health, um, and I am the grant manager for this project. And I'm going to tell you what you really want to know, which is how do you apply? <laughs> Next slide. So we have shared with you that a letter of intent for this project is recommended, but it's not required. Um, however, if you do submit a letter of intent, we would like it to include the name of the organization uh, and the main project context per, uh, information, such as their name, email, and phone number. Also in your letter of intent, we would uh, like you to include a brief description of your organization um, and really why it's interested in this project, as well as provide a list of community organizations that your organization is currently working with that would be a good fit for Regional Health Equity Council members. The letters of intent should be sent to Danielle Calloway and her email address is listed below. And I think we'll give it to you three more times before we conclude today, because three is a good number for you to remember things. Next slide. Our review process for these applications is as follows. Our proposals will be rated based on the degree to which it meets the actual rec or requirements of the request for application as well as the degree to which your organization can demonstrate um, its ability to connect with community organizations, which will include grassroots organizations that are serving the populations of focus that we sort of referenced for you earlier. Additionally, we're going to be looking at how the organization is representative of the region that it's applying for and the demonstrated capacity of your organization to perform the required functions that we've described in the request for applications. Next slide. Those completed applications are due on or before 5 p.m. on April the 14th. And once again, they're going to be emailed to Danielle Calloway. And here is her email for the second time because remember, I said you would see it three times. The subject line for your application should be application for COVID-19 health disparities project. Your narrative should not exceed seven single spaced pages in a tra traditional Times New Roman 12 point font with one inch margins all around. You should also include additional attachments of a cover page. Your attachment A, you should have three of them of the health equity council commitment forms. You should have an attachment B, which is your budget template, and an attachment C, which is your IRS W-9. Those attachments are not included in your seven pages of narrative. Next slide. On your cover page, please indicate the agency name, street address, the name of the organization's director, the actual project contact person, so their name, title, email, and phone number, and if you have a separate project lead from the person who's going to be your project contact person, then we would need some information about that person as well. So if you have, say, a director that's going to be the contact for the project, but you have a lead that's going to run the project, that would be when you would need to include two different sets of information. 
if your project lead is your project contact, then you don't need to include any additional information there. And I will pass it over to Sharonda. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sharonda Grigsby. I'm a public health consultant who works alongside Brenda Jaquetta and Afton in the Office of Equity and Minority Health. Afton told you a little bit about how to apply. I'm going to talk a little bit in the next couple of slides about what needs to be included in that seven page project narrative. There are actually three components that will be uh, evaluated and scored um, for your narrative portion of your application. Those three components include community need, project approach, and your experiences, your agency's background and experience with working with the racial and ethnic populations that you know we serve here in Michigan. In terms of community need, you should um, detail on you should include detail on how COVID-19 has impacted the racial and ethnic minority populations in your specific region. The project approach should include details, goals, strategies, and activities on your proposed project plan. The proposed work plan should be structured using smart objective format, including responsible party, timeline for completion, metrics to be evaluated and anticipated outcomes, and your strategy should align with one or more of the identified CDC project strategies, which we'll discuss on the next slide. Next slide. So here we identified the four strategies that CDC has identified within this funding opportunity. Strat strategy one um, expands, uh, should detail on how you plan to expand ex existing and or develop new mitigation and prevention resources and services to reduce COVID-19 related disparities among populations at higher risk and that are underserved. Strategy two should increase or improve data collection and reporting for populations experiencing disproportionate burden of COVID-19 infection, severe illness, and death to guide the response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Strategy three, build, leverage, and expand infrastructure support for COVID-19 prevention and control, um, and control among populations that are higher risk and underserved. And then finally, strategy four talks about mobilizing the partners and collaborators to advance health equity and address social determinants of health as they relate to COVID-19 health disparities among populations at higher risk and that are underserved. So the overall OMH strategy that the regional health councils fall under, we indicated that that strategy, that strategy falls under strategy three. We're you know, trying to build, leverage, and expand infrastructure to support COVID-19 prevention. The overall goal, as indicated to CDC by the Office of Minority Health, is to uh, for the regional councils is to establish a sustainable network of trusted community partners that can be mobilized to inform and implement strategies that improve structural gaps to current and emerging health emergencies, including policies, practices, and resource flow related to data collection and dissemination and communication strategies at the state and local level. Next slide. So continue on what should be included in your project narrative. We talked about background and experience. So the guiding questions that we've included here to help you strengthen this um, component of your application um, for your background and experience, we would like you to highlight the organization's level of experience addressing community needs through the lens of health equity. We also want to see your organization's capacity and experience to serve as a DBO a fiduciary and convener for the council, specifically mentioning skills and capacity for convening organizations that serve excluded and marginalized communities and community members. We wanna see detail on the level of experience partnering to address community needs through the lens of health equity among Michigan's racial ethnic minority populations, including experience subcontracting to direct funding to organizations serving these populations. It's also important to note in your application, your project staff roles, qualifications, and how your workforce is reflected of the communities you're, you're, you're anticipated to serve. Next slide. 
So both Athens and I think Jaquetta both mentioned the health equity commitment form. So just to reiterate, we want you, we require that three of these forms be completed for your regional organizations, including grassroots organizations serving communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19. The letter should demonstrate your organization's valued and respected standing within the community and capacity to serve as a BBO. And the letter should also affirm your organization's capacity to serve as a BBO and should be from organizations interested in participating in your regional health equity council. Next slide. So budget should be submitted utilizing the um, budget template that's included with your application. The budget categories are listed here. Um, note, one note to be um, highlighted here is that we want you to provide as much detailed information in your bus budget justification as possible. Um, an example of such would be any salaries included. We will want to see the proportion of the FTE that's being included and give some detail and um, explanation around the positions um, that are being um, entered into your budget. We will want to see the percentage of time, the percentage of, you know, for your fringe benefits. When it comes to travel meetings and workshops, we want to see some detail about, you know, the number and type of workshops. When it comes to travel, we would like to see, you know, detail about anticipated mileage for travel, anticipated cost for meetings. And, you know, that's the type of detail we would like to see in your budget justification within, you know, the template when you're creating your budget. Next slide. And just as a review, to review the timeline um, that Danielle kind of talked about earlier, just to reinforce those dates, um, the letter of intent will accept beginning March 24th, which is today. Um, we'll accept questions related to application um, for the RFA um, through um, 5 p.m. on March 29th. Important date to highlight is that applications are due by 5 p.m. April 14th. Notice of awards will be provided May 6th. Project start date, June 1st. And then our project end date of May 31st, 2023. Next slide. And we've come to the time where we can open up for questions. I'm quite sure we have many, so um, I think I'll turn it back over to Danielle and she can facilitate the way we're gonna handle the question and answer process. Thanks guys. Thank you so much, Jaquetta. Um, So it looks like there are a few questions in the chat right now. Um, the first one is for the Health Equity Council member commitment forms. Are we able to add um, CBO council members after the submission period, if we do, do we need to fill out specific forms for each at that time? Is there a specific form or just a letter from the CBO? So um, these commitment forms are just our way of seeing a picture into some of the ties that you have within the region that you're interested in applying as a BBO for. And so it isn't necessary um, you have letters of commitment for all of your members. Um, if you are interested in having more than three, that is okay. Um, but three is kind of the minimum number that we set for the number of forms that we're expecting. Um, and then we have another question about, um, can you confirm we need both letters we all, you only need um, health equity member commitment forms. You don't need letters of support as well. Um, and then we have a question about when letters of intent are due. So we didn't add a final due date for letters of intent, but we are starting to accept them starting today. Um, it is not required that you submit a letter of intent. It just kind of gives us an idea of how many folks have interest in applying um, and give us a sense. Um, and then we have a, a question. Well, the only reason I got to this is because my boss, mm -hmm. Hello? 
All right. Um, then we have a question about the funding source. So yes, this is um, funding that is kind of doing a bit of a pass through um, from the CDC. Um, is there a minimum FTE requirement for the project director? Um, so I'm not sure if you're talking about when you say project director, if, if you're talking about um, the contact for the project or specifically the coordinator role, um, but we have not set a, a minimum FTE requirement. Um, we just realized that for the level and scope of this work, you may need to hire an individual specifically to support the coordination of activities um, and the coordination of the council. Do we have to hire and pay for a coordinator if our agency has the capacity to support the position within kind time? That is a great question. Um, I think that we can look at that a bit on case by case basis, um, especially I think as the work itself forms that might really dictate some of kind of the capacity that might exist internally. Um, yes. How many grants will be provided statewide? So we are funding a total of 14 regions. We realize that there might be some backbone agencies that would be interested in applying to represent more than one region. So in, in that case, I would, I would say it really depends on how many backbone agencies we fund, but at a maximum, we will fund 14 um, if we only have one awardee per region. Um, would mini grants or regranting be allowable? That is kind of the intent of this funding here is for the backbone agency to be able to identify some of those key partners, some of those key um, community based organizations or grassroots organizations that um, that are able to do some of this work, provide some of the resources, and um, you know, really address some of the disparities that they're seeing within the community that they serve and represent. Uh, yes, the this the session will be recorded. Um, there will not be another informational session. Um, if you still have questions after today's session, feel free to email me. Um, my email will be on the next slide and it is throughout the presentation as well. Um, we will also send out the um, announcement information again to folks as well as the um, associated attachments um, along with the recording. Is there Someone asked if there was a scoring structure and how we will evaluate the proposals. So yes, we do have a scoring structure. It is based on the requirement criteria that we have outlined in the announcement and within the grant. Um, thinking about sustainability, is there potential for continuation funding after the initial year? Um, a lot of that is really dependent on um, grant sources and grant funding. Um, I will kind of pass this one over also to our partners at OEMH um, to see if they have some other um, initial bits that they would like to add to that question. Thanks, Danielle. Exactly as you stated, it depends on the availability of funds. Um, this opportunity for us when we received the grant funding was for a two year period and ends May 31st as we outlined. Um, however, a component of the objectives is to build infrastructure, is to begin to address some of the underlying inequities that we know many of our communities were experiencing. So we're looking to make the case for how expanded funding is needed with CDC. That is our goal.
assuming you want to apply for more than one region, would you need to submit a full application for both? Yes, um, we are hoping that you would um, be able to complete an application for each of the regions that you're looking to support. Um, when will the recording be sent? Um, that will be sent out within the next few days. Um, once we're able to download the recording and clean it up, we will be able to share all of that information with you all. Are there any other questions um, that folks have about today's session about the opportunity um, and the criteria? Is there a website link? Um, so all of the materials um, and the recording will be posted and the, the website will be sent to everyone that uh, registered where the link will be housed. Um, the link isn't available right now. In terms of the budget template, um, I think it's perfectly okay to set placeholders in terms of um, potential staff that you think you might hire, potential um, partners or contractors that you might need to bring in. Um, so that is that's perfectly okay if in your in your budget template you have kind of placeholders of what you think these items might be um, and some perspective costs to just give a sense of of what your budget will be for for that year um, can agencies submit a joint application so uh, um, two agencies acting together as a backbone um, organization applicant um, that I think is something that we have to, to give a bit more thought to um, and, and add that into the FAQ unless, uh, you know, I'll let any of my partners step in if they want to add to that. Now, I'll, I'll just briefly add, Danielle, that our intention definitely is for there to be collaboration and that are built. Uh, currently, our thought process is that there will be one for funded organization. So we would need to see what that partnership looks like. And as Danielle said, you know, consider that in your application. But our intent is to fund one backbone organization, even if there are partnerships. I've seen the RFA, is there a separate application? Um, so there's not a separate application like template that we've made um, just because we wanted to be able to give folks the adequate space to, to write the narrative that best describes their work and their projected work as a backbone agency. Um, so Word documents are completely fine um, for, you know, pulling together the pieces of your project narrative. Um, there is uh, the, the health equity commitment form is a fillable PDF that you can share with your partner so that they can type right into that um, form. Can you clarify the project period is one year, but I thought I heard Ms. Jagade say it was a two year initiative. Um, so yes. The grant itself um, is a, a two-year grant um, that did start last year. Um, and so through the process of getting 
the grant set up and, and getting um, kind of this objective around developing the health equity councils identified and formed um, and identifying all the application metrics. We've kind of um, reached that kind of point where it would be over a one year period for the, the health equity council work. Um, like I said earlier, it really just kind of depends on the, the ins and outs of the budget piece in terms of if this would be an initiative that would last longer than the one year period or um, what have you, but in your application and, and your formation of your um, narrative, be mindful of the fact that the project period right now is projected to be just one year. Where do we access the application? Will you be sending it as follow-up to this webinar? Yes. What are the financial reporting requirements? Are there quarterly um, FSRIs? So yeah, we will be requiring um, quarterly reports at, um, at the level of each funded organization. Um, we'll also be following up with awarded organizations um, with requirements around uh, finalized budget as well as work plan for um, the activities within the first 90 days. Um, and that looks like that's all of the questions so far. Uh, if there are any other questions, feel free to drop them on in the chat or um, raise your hand. Yes, Rachel, my contact information is in the announcement. Um, and you can also, you know, feel free to email me or call me um, if you have more specific or targeted questions. We will be, like I said, pulling all of these questions into a frequently asked questions document that we will share um, with all interested parties. So that means everyone who um, has submitted a letter of intent or who has kind of reached out and asked me um, questions specifically. So I have a, a list of names and emails who will receive the Anything else? I think it looks like questions are slowing down a bit. Um, our team will stay on for the next five minutes or so in case um, folks are still typing in the chat and, and wording their question. Um, but overall, I just wanna thank everyone for coming out today um, or, or staying in and joining us virtually. Um, we really look forward to hearing from each of you um, and really hope that you pursue the opportunity and send us some letters of intents and proposals. Again, there's my contact information as well as Afton's. Feel free to reach out to us with any questions you have um, and, you know, have a wonderful day.